everyone. Good evening. My name is Brooke Cayman Rappaport. Um, I'm the artistic director at Martin Friedman, chief curator of Madison Square Park Conservancy. Thank you all for joining me and our conservative colleagues, uh, Tom Reedy, Tree Ferry Cole, and Tasha Nabla, here this evening for what I know will be an inspiring conversation on lifting women's justice between human rights attorney Becky Heller and artist Shazia Sikander, moderated by Justice Judith Gish. Um, Madison Square Park Conservancy commissions dynamic visionary artists to create new work on or around the 6.2 acre park that daily sees 50,000 visitors. Um, artists stretch their creative practice in many ways when they bring their work into civic space. We began speaking with Shazia Sikander in the fall of 2020 about her project Golden Park. And it's been a great honor to commission her visually um, exceptional project, Hava, to breathe their life, that through golden, luminous sculptures of commanding female figures, a video animation, and an augmented reality experience advances issues around women and justice, subjects that surface, question, and critique power are central to Shazia's practice. These are also pivotal issues in our social and cultural landscape. The best public art can be physically stunning and inspire. It can challenge and provoke, and it can demand that we consider how ideas that are central in our lives take new shape through the works of art and chart a course for the future. Um, this is a project of many firsts. It's Shazia's first major sculptural public art project. This is our first collaboration with the courthouse of the Appellate Division, First Department of the Supreme Court of the State of New York across the street. And our thanks to the Municipal Art Society for introducing us to presiding Justice Rolando Acosta, Justice Peter Moulton, and Justice Diane Renwick, all of whom were advocates for updating and opening up the visual program in and around the historic courthouse. Um, Hava is a co-commission with Public Art at the University of Houston, where the project will travel in October of 2023. Foundation Fellows, and we thank the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation for their support, and for suggesting through Shazia that when fellows from different fields meet and speak in public space, ideas can often align to inspire communities. Um, Please let me introduce our speakers. Our moderator this evening is Justice Judith Gish, a lifelong New Yorker. Uh, she received a BA and JD from SUNY Buffalo. For the last 32 years, up until December 2022, she served as a judge in the New York State court system. Beginning in 1990, she presided over various trial courts throughout the city of New York, including the Housing Court, the New York City Civil Court, and the New York State Supreme Court. In 2012, Justice Gish was elevated to preside in the Appellate Division First Department. She is a member of the Board of, the Direct the board of Directors of the New York Women's Bar Association. Becca Heller grew up in California, attended Dartmouth College and Yale Law School. She is Luxembourg and an MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. She's a 2006 MacArthur Fellow, and she received the United States Medal of Arts in 2012. She became a Fukuoka Laureate in 2022 as a recipient of the Arch and Culture Prize from Fukuoka, Japan. Uh, last month, she received the Pollock Prize for Creativity from the Pollock Prize Foundation. Shanzia sat on the Mayoral Advisory Commission on Monuments, Markers, and City Art in 2017. This was the group that reckoned with historic monuments across the city and the dearth of women people of color represented in those monuments. And this has certainly informed her project, Hava, as Shazia has created new, triumphant civic art in female form. It is such a thrill to convene these great minds and these women of great agency together this evening. Um, and now we're going to welcome Justice Gish and the speakers to the podium. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's a huge, huge honor for me to be here um, as a participant on this panel. I am going to give a short presentation for about 15 minutes. And um, so I like to believe 
that the function of art is to allow multiple meanings and possibilities, to open up space for a more just world. How we experience art, how we respond to it, how we interpret it, is an open-ended premise. As an artist, it is my intent to create something wondrous and with many possible associations, something that can generate thought and produce difference. So beginning in the 19, um, mid-1980s, my work pioneered a visual art form now known as neo-miniature, bringing into dialogue Central and South Asian manuscript painting traditions with contemporary international practices. Grounded in extensive research of reductive visual textual representations in 19th and 20th century colonial archives, the work aimed to remedy narrow narratives by shifting themes around race, empire, diaspora, gender, sexuality, and politics. So these polarizing dichotomies have long existed, such as East, West, Islamic, Western, Asian, White, oppressive, free. So it led to my work in this form of an outburst of forms that were very androgynous, fragmented bodies, sometimes um, headless torsos, self-rooted, floating, half-human figures, almost all characters that refuse to belong, to be fixed, or be stereotyped. So many female iconographies came about as a means of resisting categorization. I was responding to my inability to locate brown, South Asian representations in the feminist space in the 1990s art world and art history books. So oftentimes I'd be working from memory, from archives, research, as well as intuitively as a painter, collaboratively between materials with the desire to be multivalent. I could look at visual traditions, not only the manuscript histories, but Western art history, practices of writing, poetry, calligraphy, combined with syncretic sculpture. The knitting together of these references and mythologies, as well as more private inner encounters, dreams, and fantasies, gave birth to my explorations of the feminine power. I would often say that these figures were com coming out of, uh, out of my hand as a comment on the lack of female artists represented in art history and the art world, and often the misogyny women encounter in all, almost all spheres of work and life. So this act of drawing became about converting erasure into opportunity through wit and candor. The, this repertoire of forms and figures emerge often in these gestural ink drawings, murals, animations, the resulting characters, often female but sometimes endogenous, repeatedly entered the work. But all along, I would say that the playful stances of these women, confident, intelligent, proactive, were tied to the past in imaginative ways without you know, being tied to a heteronormative lineage or conventional representations of diaspora and the nation. Few examples here um, that are clearly connected to the two sculptures in the park and on the roof of the courthouse. <coughs> So a pageant of archetypes that celebrate female sensuality and desire. The central portrait that you see here with the horns, conjoining fragmented bodies also suggests commonalities, hybridity, multiplicity, continual state of becoming. So after the attacks of 9-11, the work itself further evolved with the addition of these jet planes in response, perhaps to the paternalistic justification for the war in Afghanistan as saving, quote unquote, Muslim women. So this work points to the joyous sensual depictions of feminine power, and so flirtatiously entwines with a figure drawn from the Italian manners painting, an allegory with Venus and Cupid by Bronzino. So I created this pairing in response to Parka Mitter's 1977 book, Much Maligned Monsters, a history of European responses to Indian art choosing figures from outside the classical Western canon to push against the power structures that construct histories. 
the ideas that were encapsulated in that work are, are all, they are part of the DNA of my work and then they evolved further in this um, sculpture that I did in um, 20 years later from that particular work, but promiscuous intimacies where you see these the protagonists, the two women intertwined female bodies that bear the symbolic weight advisory right. commission on city arts monuments and markers. Because in that process, I you know, heard all these different public opinions, studied public monuments, complicated histories, the historical reckoning and tensions between overt male representations of historical monuments. And I thought that you know how how I saw my work as an anti-monument. So that's when I decided to pull out the protagonists from the painting and re-engage them in a sculptural format. So when I research historical visual um, traditions, I inspired to cultivate new associations for trenchant historical of um, visual traditions, but from more than one vantage point. So um, this affinity that I've always had for the anti-monument in my work, in my practice, is basically how I engage the past without glorifying it. It doesn't lay claim to any grandiosity. It's often ephemeral. The works are usually on paper, murals, installation, animations, which rarely get seen through the lens of the anti-monument. So that's when I decided, oh, all I need to do is perhaps make, make the drawing into a sculpture and see what would happen. And that resulted in the sculpture, which is uh, uh, now in witness. And you can see in the image here that the image on the right, fleshy weapons, the, the sort of red form, the self-rooted character is very much um, embodied in the sculptures as well. So I just wanted to show that the thread has been ongoing and it exists um, for a long time in the work. So um, art constantly being reevaluated and reinterpreted in the world, both embody a dynamic which is alive and tethered to its present moment. Body becomes a powerful tool that carries its social construction. So it can also function as a site of resistance. The feminine at the center of, in my work, as well as in the, these two sculptures now in witness, are stylized, enigmatic, they are female and fluid. Part of the body loops out and into itself a deeper truth beyond its form, alluding to perception as illusion, popular in images in many cultures. It also expresses intangible ideas of humility, awakening, and clarity. The invisible roots of the lotus that lie below the depth of the water are echoed in the roots of the feminine figure in both the, both the characters in the sculptures that are in the park and on the courthouse uh, court roof. So the form, the form of the lotus, its circular bloom with its petals, within petal formation, also to me refers to the microcosm and the macrocosm in this very iconographical value that it offers in, in its sort of an arabesque in the, in the structure of the petals. So the uh, now, which is the eight foot sculpture on the roof, uses the same feminine form as in witness. And instead of the skirt, it, uh, of the skirt raising the body, the body is emerging out of the seat of the lotus. But both the forms are sort of rising upward. The in, 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 implied is this sort of uh, buoyancy of the feminine um, spirit. Taking inspiration, in, um, in the sort of very beautiful, spectacular stained glass ceiling dome of the Appalachian Courthouse, its translucency defined architectural properties. I also thought of reimagining the dome as a, as a house, perhaps an armor, a structure, a space demarcating a site of renewal, but all of the glass ceiling. So, uh, so you see this here, the longitudinal, latitudinal lines of the ceiling dome are echoed in the sky, becoming the imaginary hockey lines coming together across east, west, north, south. So both the sculptures have this again, this sort of uh, play with materiality as well in the glass. So here, the, the, the spurt is echoed through the formation of, of glass mosaic. And, um, here again, there's another link to an older work called House. 
both the sculptures have uh, this, um, this sort of another feminine form with the hair, which is spiraling. And the hair spiraling, of course, has been picked up a lot as the horns. Well, here, a work in particular, the, the where I have uh, the bodies of the feminine, um, of these bodies with the female characters that um, generate in this particular uh, courthouse space, the Darbar Hall, a formal meeting space traditionally reserved for displays of authority. And in reimagining how these little women characters infiltrate the space, and then they leave their bodies behind, but leave the traces of their hair. So it was my way of playing with animation, playing with history, playing with feminine sort of particle systems as a means to create choreography to disrupt um, symbolisms of patriarchy and sovereignty. So here you can see the hair uh, choreographed as further into these movements in Times Square when I did the midnight movement. So this representation of women in traditionally patriarchal spaces and especially spaces that are centered on delivering justice and adjudicating power is a much needed restorative in civic life. Now and witness demand a reimagining of the feminine, not simply as lady justice with a scales, but of the female as an active agency, a thinker, a participant, as well as a how erasure is enacted by the social forces that shape women's lives. So throughout literature, the notion of the female has been in conversation with the invisible, visible divide, feminine as the monstrous, the abject, the fecund, the immense, the vulnerable, intimacy, self failure, resistance, femininity's intersections, especially with race and war, that become markers of the fear that lurks when boundaries melt. Which leads me to just share another body of work that I have done, especially this, this body, which is about the so-called Christmas trees, the oil rigs that have come to symbolize the tragedy of capitalism premised on the instrumental art, art iconography. So this image of justice as a woman, of course, has been present for centuries, but women you know, only gained judicial voice in the last one. So, what does that mean? And, and that all of that plays a role in the construction of the sculpture. So I kind of quickly wanted to share a couple of other images around the piece, which um, where the word hava, which means air, atmosphere, to breathe, and also kind of like as, a, uh, as another sort of pun suggests E. So these are the, the letters around the, the piece uh, are, are these design letters created with the glass um, mosaic that, that spell that out. And the, the relationship between the mosaic to me is really about the, again, um, so you get these opportunities, you know, you were, so, so there is that too, that the work that I wanted to make had to embody the ethos of women, their tenacity, as well as their multiplicity. And also, I think oftentimes I've wondered who gets to be an American as in part of the American art history canon, and who is relegated to the periphery. In my experience, I've often been straight-jacketed in terms of my biography, so that too, I think, is an important uh, context here in terms of getting the visibility that this work is uh, providing an artist like myself. So all these different layers are out there, and uh, for me, the work celebrates women's wisdom, resilience, whether it's in the garden or atop the courthouse, and it's pushing ideas of broader representation of female empowerment, and of course, the multiplicity of <laughs> Together to discuss a, a, a common theme. What's the common theme that we can talk to you about that we all have passionate feelings about? And I think what you're going to find is over the course of our conversation that what we want to talk about or what we have the ability to talk about is the impact of images of women of power in society. What do they mean? Whether those images are real images in, in life form, like real women judges, or whether they are in artistic form 
as, as Shazia's work is, and that's given us an opportunity to talk and think about it. Um, I'm going to start off just as a matter of personal privilege and say a few remarks, and then I'm going to turn most of the conversation over to Becca and Shazia. I mean, that, those many years on, on the bench, I have seen great changes in terms of the number of women judges that are on the bench. And that's true both in the New York State, it's true in all of the state court systems and statistics that are kept, as well as in the federal court system. So one of them is in the area of domestic violence, which has really changed dramatically in New York State. And I'm just gonna give a, a nod here to one of my colleagues, Ross Richter, who was very instrumental in all of those changes over the years and still works towards that. We also have um, changes in terms of statute of limitations so that people who are victims, uh, and they were mostly women, or a lot of women, not solely, but a lot, um, uh, of uh, 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 crimes, sexual crimes, now have extended statutes of limitations, which were not otherwise available to them. And, and finally, as an example, I think that since the Me Too movement, um, there have been a lot of changes in the jurisprudence of how we look at sexual assault cases. And I'm going to give a nod here to another one of my colleagues, Angela Mass. What you, what you believe the impact of that is, visually and societally, for her to be the first woman sculpture on the top of, of our courthouse? Well, um, all I have to say is that it should have happened earlier. <laughs> 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 Opportunity to have the work on on the roof of the courthouse. This is a very different conversation, and the context of that is really interesting. How it's charging a very it's a catalyst for a different conversation that may not necessarily have happened if it was uh, if it was just in the park, or or in my experience the painting. So so sort of like having similar themes and painting and then having the painting become a 3D sculptural form is, is exciting to see how a different type of conversation is coming about. So you mentioned in your talk, you said context matters, where art is matters, and you, you said that to me earlier this evening as well. Does the fact that um, the art is on top of the courthouse does it give it a different context than, say, the sister sculpture that is in the, the park? Or should we look at them as a unit? They are connected. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of the project, which is Hava. Mm -hmm. So both are connected also through the AR lens as well, but they both share the same similar feminine, um, feminine form which is uh, just a self-rooted notion, sort of giving a broader representation to the idea of the female. So it's not literally the female body, but it is a sketch in ink. So also how to bring the sort of amorphous notion of the self into a sculptural space. But of course, the history of, of the, the, the sculpture, sculptures on the roof and the fact that um, the, the male element of the ten um, male lawgivers, philosophers, so be it. Like the history of that, as well as in the inside the court courthouse, there is a very particular history representation of history. All of it was done in 1899, so it is it is stuck in that time. Right, the time frame. The courthouse opened in 1900. Right. Yeah, so the, the artwork on top of the, the roof that depicts male lawgivers, they actually depict um, actual people or uh, historical um, people who are regarded as lawgivers and they are um, uh, physical representations of who those people are. I would are. argue. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, I want to hear that it's argument. Like, who's representing yeah. the same idea as the Eurocentrism in the art world, in Western art history, is incredibly Eurocentric. It's 
Also, when others are represented, the, it's usually from the position of the, the colonial imperial premise. That's how histories have been shaped. So who gets to tell the story is often the person in power. So that's what also needs to be understood is that there are, there are different stories from different perspectives. And uh, the, the sort of allegorical ideas of, of the male representatives does not necessarily make them uh, just one representation of the truth. One representative class is also, also which has come about as people that may have not seen the work or not even reading about it. So that's that. That it does pay some homage to her, but it's uh, not her, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it uh, does. It's and the, the, you, could, and you could explain what what part of the the uh, sculpture pays homage to her. Personal, which is that um, I think. Growing up for a long time, like I was very aware that like gender discrimination existed, but I didn't feel like it had applied to me that much. Like I was never afraid to raise my hand or um, sort of intimidated to like speak out on things until, and then I got to law school and I was like, oh my gosh. Like it, you just, it just sort of fully hits you in the face, like how gendered the law is. Even from like the very idea that like the way to reach truth is for two people to take opposite sides and then argue about it. I would argue is a very masculine approach. Uh, our clients and kind of American, this is an oversimplification, but there are clients in American Muslims um, who are being discriminated against, even if though they weren't like themselves affected by the travel ban, simply by like the symbolism of the law allowing to be passed and the US like endorsing this. Um, as an okay way to discriminate according to like who could come here. When there was this regime change, there were women in positions of power, and then now they are not. And we started to discuss, and I'd be happy to continue that discussion now, what impact you thought that had on, on your clients, on the people who you serve, who, who I'm just gonna say are, because their families it, it involve many, many women and children. So, so you know, prior to prior to the U.S. invasion and occupation, if you will, of Afghanistan, um, the Taliban ruled, and women couldn't do anything. They couldn't go to school. They couldn't show their faces. Um, when the U.S. came in and effectuated regime change, um, one of the positives of that is that women were allowed to start going to school. A lot of women became members of parliament. Women became judges. Um, there was a very ill-fated attempt uh, by the U.S. to like gender integrate the Afghan National Army, um, which they decided to do starting with four women, um, who they brought here to train as helicopter pilots. Two of them sought asylum here and then went back. Two of them went back and the Afghan National Army refused to let them serve and then tried to kill them. Um, so then they ended up getting resettled back here as refugees. But I think that's like a, to me it was like a yes, like gender integration is a good idea, but like the implementation is also very important. You can't just take like four women and literally like throw them to the Afghan National Army. Um, but you know, and then to no one's surprise, uh, after the U.S. withdrawal, the the Taliban has been targeting a, a number of folks, but in particularly women in positions who who held positions of power under the last regime. Um, and so there have been a lot of efforts to sort of get out like. The same women that the U.S. went to and said, you know, you're going to bury your break in this society, like we're going to train you and you're going to have the opportunity to remake what the role of women is, um, are now, it made them also very visible. Um, so there's pretty clear kill lists um, of just like women who assumed power in some way. Um, and a lot of them are trying to escape and the U.S. has made all sorts of promises to them about bringing them in through the refugee program, but has not implemented it. Um, so there's like a category of refugees that include sort of like women human rights defenders of all stripes that's supposed to have special access um, to US immigration systems under US law. Um, and the US has just never put that into practice. And so they're being assassinated. They're trying to flee to neighboring countries like Pakistan and Iran. Um, but I think, you know, and then, you know, recently, you, I don't know if people read about um, the Taliban banning women from working for international aid organizations 
And most of the major aid organizations responded to that by deciding to pull out of the country. Um, and, and I think you could debate that all day, because um, it was one of those things where there was like no right answer. Um, but the Taliban has done this, and now, you know, IRC, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, no one's operating on the ground there anymore, um, which means that sort of key services aren't being provided, uh, but also that all the women who are employed by those organizations no longer have jobs. So I, I feel like wow. it's sort of like overly simplistic, like sledgehammery ways to try to um, fix things. But then if you're not willing to like actually engage in the nitty gritty of like, what does this mean on the ground? How does this get implemented? How do we follow through and keep our promises to the people? You know, the first person to do anything is always like putting themselves on the line. You put yourself on the line by doing the sculpture, right? There's been some backlash to it. Um, and so like, how do we, if, if we want that and we want to keep moving forward, how do we then make sure that we provide protection to those who are willing to kind of step out in front of it? Um, or follow up on the comments that you made about the importance of art being seen and being in public places and the work that you did with the advisory commission in 2017. Can you explain a little bit about that work and how it may have informed what your decisions were and your goals were in terms of the prison art work in the courthouse and in the park? Absolutely. Um, you know, the ideas of the monuments, it's a very male, overtly male dominated representation. So um, the, the one thing that, that kept coming to me was that, of course, like there is a lack of female representations and stories of, of, of female histories. But it wasn't something that, you know, um, was uh, unfamiliar. It's, erasure of women or lack of women or expunging of women's narratives from history has been a very present theme throughout literature, poetry, uh, art representation, so politics. So it's been, it, it's just um, present also in the landscape of public art space. Plus also monuments, can, no one monument or one type of, of uh, representation can claim to represent an entire history or entire country or entire society or race or segment of any any particular historical event or story so it's the same in these in the in this culture it's a temporary project in different types of conversations so if we can have get a feel of the of, of the type of that temperature and what art can have how it can happen i think Especially academic institutions, smaller museums, maybe other courthouses. So I, I, we don't know yet, but uh, it's definitely a great start in the first think, couple of weeks. Right. One of the one of the, the remarkable things for me is that your artwork is not in a museum; it's in a public venue. And so when we talk about, because I know you've talked about the discussion that's gone on, and it's it's been interesting. I think had it been in a museum, maybe not so much attention or so much discussion. So art being in a public place holds a certain um, advantage in terms of raising the level of awareness and discussion. That would be my point of view on it. I liked your framing of it as an opening salvo. <laughs> <laughs> you see more women images. I will say over the years, two languages, what meaning resonates the most to you at this moment? Hava as a breath and Hava as an idea to allow space. So it, that resonates the most to me. Something that is uh, temporary, it's breathing, we all need it, it's oxygen. And of course the playfulness of uh, Eve <laughs> as the first lawbreaker. <laughs> yes, I think, uh, you know, just uh, that's just uh, something and the, and that the I sculpture, enjoyed. Yeah, the sculpture on the, on the, the rooftop is now. What is the significance of that female sculpture? There's some follow-ups, so I'm going to follow them down. Uh, was the spot empty or did another sculpture need to be removed? It, if so, how did you decide which, which statue to remove? So yes, so just to clarify, no sculpture has been 
removed. Nobody is replacing or canceling anyone. <laughs> I was just surprised that nobody had yet proposed, no other other had proposed a project to the court to have uh, something on the roof because there, there was a empty area on the extreme east side of the roof. So that's where the uh, way now has, has gone, but it has not replaced anything. Holding the scales of justice, and, and why did you choose to make the, the, the statue gold? So, um, In any order, you can answer that. <laughs> so I, I think like the idea of the gold was also coming from a sculpture I had done in 2020, which was uh, using a lot of ochre. So the, the one on the roof is not gold. It is uh, just, it's a body color, which is more brown. Mm -hmm. And it's engaging with the, it's hand painted in different shades of ochre, just mm -hmm. a little bit of metallic paint. So it's not really talking to the boldness, but more to the fact that classical statuary was often colored. And it over time, the colors in many, like there's a whole conversation and debate going around this also in terms of like how, we're, how we imagine a certain classical uh, uh, Greco-Romans uh, aesthetic to be, in fact, there, there is a lot of uh, argument and um, his historical things about how the sculptures were painted and sometimes in really bright colors and over time mm -hmm. they have, that color has been removed. So, so there's, it's so plain to that as well. Mm -hmm. and 